pleasure this morning to be able to introduce Dr. Rob Lester, who is a neuroendocrinologist in the department and a professor of pediatrics and pediatrics here at UCSA. Uh, Dr. Lester was born in Brooklyn, uh, went to MIT for undergrad, medical school at St. Louis University, a residence in medical school at um, at Cornell and uh, residents at Flinders University, uh, spent time at St. Jude's Hospital, did a uh, fellowship here at UCSF. St. Jude's was after that, was caught in a few other places, and, uh, and then has come back where he also got a law degree at Hastings and has been particularly interested in pediatric and adult obesity and the variety of ways that that developed, especially um, thinking about processed foods and the kind of things that we eat, that we eat. I enjoyed a number of spirited conversations with Rob about kids and eating and about things too like metabolic syndrome and uh, kids that we treat with anthropomic uh, medications. The thing that I what I've come to admire the most about Rob is that he's an activist. He puts his mouth where, um, and he puts it, he goes where, uh, wherever his mouth is taking him, but he's a strong advocate. And uh, he had a YouTube that went viral a few years ago that was called um, uh, the, the, Bitter, the Bitter Truth, over 5 million hits on YouTube. That, uh, brought a lot of attention to what we're eating and the way that people are putting things into our foods. So I'm always stimulated by his talk, more than sugar, and I look forward to hearing him talk today about sugar, hormones, and addiction. Thank you, Bob, for that kind of introduction. I want to ask how kind it was to us. It was just. It's very tempting now to see if I'm actually texting where your mouth goes. The difference is that, um, uh, like Daniel Patrick Monaghan said, you're entitled to things that you're not entitled to on the So I'm going to give you the facts today, and then I'll show you why those have developed into specific opinions. So first of all, I've noticed that it's better than that I did write this long form book for the public as a public therapist, um, so that that is a conflict of interest, or at least a potential conflict of interest, so you um, need to at least know that. But I do not take money from any industry to So the big question is, who did this? That's a big question now that is being asked worldwide, and there are a lot of people weighing in on it, and it has enormous policy implications for the future. The way public seems to know this, in fact, I'll learn my next dean, uh, David Kessler, way in on this, with his book, and the other thing here. Um, the question is, you know, what's the science behind this question, this issue, and, you know, can we actually get there? And uh, I'm going to try to take you through that. First of all, if you think about obesity and you think about addiction, there are a tremendous number of overlaps in terms of the psychology. System can be the same. Mechanisms of reward, dopamine, uh, relevance of kinetic, uh, regulation of intake are a little bit different, but maybe not so much, especially when we start talking about dopamine, which we will do. Uh, the physiological role, that's where things start breaking apart. Because obviously, food is necessary for survival. And so, the people who are on the other side of the food addiction argument say, how can something that's necessary for survival? be addictive. In fact, if you broke your addiction, you would die. So how can that be an addiction? That's the wrong way, it's the other way around. So the question is, is everything that we consume a food? And that's one we're going to get to at the very end, and that's basically where this is all going to land. So you will see. And the role of stress in terms of either causing increased eating or use of drug use, very similar. And the areas of the brain are virtually identical as well, as we will see. And there are certain foods that stimulate those areas of the brain in the limbic system, like BTA, the nucleus accumbens, and the thalamus, the 
people that put up so different when we say policy. So we're going to talk about the ethical line and the board studies as well. So we're all sort of familiar with this model that Norval Cal came up with several years ago about how you go from a non addicted brain to an addicted brain. Nobody comes out of the room addicted unless, of course, the money was a protein addict. But still, in life, no one's addicted. These are all, quote, learned behaviors. And the question is, how did you learn them? Well, the idea is that the saliency drives the nucleus accumbens and the dopamine that drive ultimately impacts on the uh, orbital frontal cortex. You are Jimmy Cricket, if you will, that keeps you from doing stupid things. And you have control as well from the central gyrus. And somehow, the saliency ultimately overpowers your ability to be able to control those drives. And that leads to dependence. And then if you lose those neurons, that leads to a different At least that's the concept. Okay? And there's the stop, and there's the goal, if you will. Okay. Can we measure a victim in humans? So, um, Dick at Yale, uh, Ashley Gearhart, working with Kelly Brownell several years ago, came uh, uh, forward with a validated scale that's now also validated for children called the Yale Food Addictive Scale. And it asks simple questions of people in order to get this uh, question, uh, because otherwise, how could you know if somebody really was addicted? Well, it turns out that when you look at the responses to that scale, in fact, it correlates with fMRI activation of these limbic system areas that we've just been talking about. So, again, at least it is a um, questionnaire marker for altered brain activity. However, the few things trigger these areas as well, which, again, you'd be no surprise. They probably do it in everybody. They just do it less in people with obesity because they presumably have downregulated their dopamine receptor. And there's an overlap between binge eating disorder and addiction, a very clear uh, 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 overlap. Um, virtually 90% uh, of the people who are asked about binge eating disorder, whether they are addicted to specific foods, means to ultimately become a CS. Okay. Having said that, there are a lot of people on the other side. For instance, this group in, the, in Europe, uh, led by uh, Sebastian Ricci and Paul Fletcher, and they came out with this article in Nature Neuroscience, uh, Obesity in the Brain, How Convincing is the Addiction Model, basically arguing that all of these things are necessary for survival. This does not meet the dominant uh, properties. So it's outside, if you will, Nicole Vida, who had worked with Paul Fogel at Princeton University, one of the first people to show us sugar is addictive. Well, this back and tossing the baby out with the bathwater after the brief rinse, the potential downside of the system for reduction based on limited data, to which they then wrote back a whole letter to the other food addiction is there even a baby in the bathwater. You can see that this thing is getting very contentious. And there's a reason why it's contentious, not just because it matters to us, but it matters to companies and it matters ultimately to government. Because if it becomes addiction, somebody ends up paying for it. So if, you can, if people can keep it out of that, then it changes, shall we say, the healthcare paradigm. So it really does matter. This group in Europe, in fact, has said it's not food addiction, rather it's eating addiction. That, in fact, it's the behavior in the same way kleptomania is an addiction. There's a food addiction, there's just a behavior rather than the food itself. And that is not just semantic. Whether it's the behavior or the food matters a lot. So we have to be very specific and we have to be very tight with our science in order to be able to answer this question. This question actually caused Mark Gold, former uh, chair of psychiatry at Florida, and one of the pioneers in this field, who had written at least six separate reviews on the concept of food addiction. When he and Todd Brunel published their textbook, they changed it from food addiction to food and addiction. So I specifically have to get it caught up in the site. So this semantic issue is not semantic at all. It's actually quite uh, important. So let's talk about what the science says. There are two separate sets of uh, uh, inputs that go into this issue, and we really have to learn both of them. 
in order to be able to understand where this is coming from. He said, what is the indirect effect of food on the reward system? Not necessarily through direct food stuff activation of the increase of numbers, but through the hormones that mediate the effect. And those two hormones are left in an insulin, and that's what I come into this today. So, you're probably all familiar with some form of this schematic diagram of the neuroendocrinology of uh, energy balance. There are these four hormones that come from elementary sources of some sort. Okay? Growing and peptide YY, those two are, so I say, minute to minute hormones. Growing is the hunger hormone. When your stomach is empty, growing goes up, goes to your brain, activates specific Y5 receptors in the brain and to tell your brain, I'm hungry, feed me. You put food in the stomach, growing goes down. That's to be the end of hunger, right? It's supposed to be the end of the meal, right? It's not. Just because you lower your growing doesn't mean you stop eating. Everyone can eat past the end of hunger and do. Once the food enters the stomach, then it goes through the intestine, and there are 22 feet of intestine. At the end of the intestine, the same cells that secrete GLP-1 also secrete another hormone called peptide YY336. That hormone circulates in the bloodstream, goes to the hypothalamus, binds to the Y2 receptors, and says, I'm full, I'm done, I won't eat another bite. That is the problem. So you can eat past the end of hunger easily. Especially if it's childhood. It's not until you get to childhood that food intake stops. And then it's going to speak between the end of hunger and satiety. It takes time. So in our clinic, what we do is we tell people, after you're giving your kid the plate of food, the kid says, I'm still hungry. What they really need to say is that my end of hunger is gone, but I haven't gotten my satiety signal yet, so I could still eat. When you explain it that way, get the scope and get it, and they say, oh, so I tell them, look at the clock. Look at the clock, 20 minutes. Not one minute soon. Put the food in the microwave for the last time or whatever. Let this kid leave the kitchen. No respiratory uh, 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 cues. Let me do my homework. Let me go outside and play. If I come back 20 minutes later, fine, you're making a sentence. Let the hormones work for you instead of against you. And it works like this part work. So these two elementary hormones are meal to meal. But it's these two hormones that we're going to talk about today, leptin and insulin. Now, leptin is a hormone that comes from your fat cell that goes to your brain and says, I have enough energy on board so that I don't have to conserve and I can engage in expensive metabolic processes such as puberty, pregnancy. I can contribute to survival of the species through reproduction, through puberty and pregnancy. When your leptin levels go down because you are starving, your brain senses that I'm in starvation mode, I need to conserve because I'm not able to contribute to reproduction, and I have to worry about my own life. Therefore, sympathetic tone goes down, and of course, vagal tone to increase even goes up. Insulin is very interesting, though. Insulin is the last hormone in this cascade, and you'll notice it has two effects, not one, but two. One on the fat cell, which says four. So, you eat a meal, your insulin goes up. Virtually all the excess takes to fat because of the action of insulin on lipoprotein lipase at the level of the adipose cell. So, however, the second effect of insulin is up here at the brain, where it says, hey, I'm in the middle of metabolizing the meal. I don't need to eat anymore. And so it can be part of the supply signal if it's working correctly. So, insulin is a fascinating Midas um, or a uh, list in, in this story because here it uh, perfectly it says store, whereas centrally it says stop. Two different, completely opposite effects all at the same time. And it's through this dysfunction that we end up 
is the This is the power. It's just the way of the five-year-old kid of Thank you. 
Thank you. 
program of ethanol has an energy density of 7 kilos. Okay. Now they've given alcohol and caffeine acid in order to say that there's no such thing as food addiction. The middle fast exempts both alcohol and caffeine, even though both of them are in our food. Sometimes whether we like it or not. And then with this whole fact, we're going to return to this at the end. Alcohol, caffeine, alcohol, caffeine, and blazing that across your forehead. Okay, now let's talk about fasting. So make a list of a whole book, no surprise when you ask that. What's this book? Salt, sugar, fat, how the food giants look like. You got it right. How many heard about it? You've heard about fasting. You know it's fasting. Okay? This is what's in fasting. Salt, sugar, fat, and caffeine. So let's take each of these in turn. Let's start with salt. It is salt addictive. There is some data in rodents that it increased dopamine signaling in response to salt. You can even see some binging and some cross sensitization of that pain, suggesting that there might be some addictive properties. However, in humans, we know that there's a lower threshold of physiologic effects that puts a move. We know that higher levels contribute to preference or serious, but you can retrain those as people on the vast diet do all the time. And lastly, I like to care of people with salt congen uh, using congenital human hypertension. These people are eating salt like crazy, and they're losing salt like crazy, and they continue to eat and lose salt like crazy until you treat them with glucocosone, which then binds to the aldosterone receptor and causes salt retention, and then their uh, salt craving goes away. So if anybody ought to be addicted and ought to be the person who's continuing to consume it, then we can stop that. Let's move on. Let's go to sex. So, rodents do have a but they show no signs of dependence. They can stop at any time. In humans, these foods are high in fat, certainly, but they're also high in carbs and sugar, like pizza or ice cream. So, which one is it that they're really uh, uh, having a problem with? It's likely that adding sugar increases preferences for fatty foods like cookie dough. Yeah. Um, the Atkins diet, you know, is all fat, no carbs. And they lose weight and they reduce their food intake. And in fact, if you look at the both rodent and primate models of high fat diet and beast obesity, if you actually give them a high fat diet, they don't get obese. In fact, they lose weight. You have to replace the fat with sugar in order to get them to consume more. So it's a 60% fat diet, but it's a 10% sugar diet. If you don't put the sugar in, they lose weight. So every time you see the word high fat diet on a study, you have to look at the methodology to determine what did they mean by that. And they called this notion of a high fat diet all from the entire medical establishment. It is not a high fat diet, it's a high fat, high sugar diet. And so the energy density does not show an association with obesity and metabolic control. So, fat, not a big deal. Increases failures, that's all. Which would you rather have? A pixie stick or a cinnamon? Oh, not a big deal in all of us. Now, caffeine. Caffeine is a mild drug of dependence. We all know that. And if you take my Starbucks away from me, I will kill you. In humans, dependence is done in children, adolescents, and adults. meets the DSM criteria for dependence. And there's even physiologic addiction that's been established with the headache, the ability to catch performance disease, etc. So, caffeine, absolutely addictive. But toxic? Is caffeine toxic? Well, if you mix it with alcohol, it is. Well, for the local, that's banned now. Okay, but caffeine in itself, not addictive. Buy all the energy pills, not addictive. Unless you get an arrhythmia and die, but that's good. Now, let's get to the big kahuna. So, is sugar addictive? Yes or no? Okay. The group in Europe says sugar is not addictive. This is a review, not a paper, not a uh, peer review paper. I'm going to show you now a video clip that challenges this notion. I want you all to listen very 
with the wife, right? She goes to get the wife. Now, obviously, an end of one is not stopping. But an end of one can be discovered. It can lead you to ask, ask questions like, is that true? I mean, is that how a clock will end up in heroin? Because it's not a mystery. I don't know. Well, we actually know that sugar does stuff to the brain. Does anybody know what this is? Like the interesting thing was? Well, it's threes. Like threes. So what is threes? There's a super concentrated sucrose solution that you dip the pacifier in and stick it in the newborn boy's mouth before the circumcision. The Jews have wine and the rest of the world has three. Because it releases opioids. It's a pain, it's an analgesic. So, this concept of sugar has properties that work on the pain and the distant pathway is not so crazy. We use it every day for that reason. And in fact, we have to be grateful for that. Why we can't resist it? So that's kind of getting into the dependence argument, isn't it? Why is there really such a thing as sugar addiction? We have to look for similarities to other drugs of dependence, like nicotine, morphine, amphetamine, and cocaine. And the one I think is the most appropriate is alcohol. And you'll see why in a minute. I think the sugar and alcohol map on each other virtually identically. So, first of all, what makes a milkshake so rewarding? Is it the fat, or is it the sugar, or is it something else? And exercise is done this by sticking different concentrations of our fat milkshakes through a straw while lying in an fMRI scanner to see what areas of the brain light up as you change the amount of fat or sugar. Turns out the fat changes the mass field. It's not a sensory cortex, which is important and increases the salience. But only sugar stimulated the nuclear components. Only sugar generated the reward signal, not the fat. So, yes, <clears throat> the fat increased salience is that important in the story? Sure, but it's not addictive by itself. you got to add the sugar first. Okay. Now, other studies have shown the same thing. This one came out very recently out of Switzerland. So, no satiety or fullness of peptides compared to glucose, in part because of those phenomena of growing and peptide YY, because fructose does not suppress growing. No insulin binds with fructose, so you don't know that you've eaten. And on the fMRI, you can see that glucose stimulated a completely different part of the brain. It stimulated the striatum, whereas fructose stimulated the entire rest of the limbic system, the parts that we're carrying about. In animals, <coughs> there is very clear data. And this is what from the Colombian and Barbobo telling that sugar shows binging, withdrawal, craving, and plus sensitization of other drugs of abuse. Meaning, if you expose an animal to one uh, uh, substance of abuse for three weeks and get hooked, and then expose them to a second one, they're addicted to that one too because the dopamine receptors are the same, and they've all been down regulated. This is the way they do their rat model with the big team. They basically, what they do is they uh, normally a dark animal has access to food. They give the animal four hours of no access to food. Then they throw in the sugar and the cow access, and they let the cow be there for four hours after the last so long, and then they require it again. They do this for three weeks, and through the cycling, they can actually get addiction. And they can show that right here in the hippocampus and the nucleus tendons cell, the distant dopamine receptors. They can show it in terms of gene expression in different areas of the brain. They can show it on the plus layers. It has to do with withdrawal. You can see here in the cycle it they spend way less time on the open arms and much more time on the closed arms because they're anxious. Okay. And it, it can be turned around with naloxone. They also show craving. So if you take the sugar away and then we expose them two weeks later, they go hard wild. And finally, cross sensitization with other drugs of abuse. When you cycle them and then you challenge them with amphetamine, they get this massive increase in response. So, sugar addictive in animals. Now, what about humans? So, right now we have a new set of criteria because the DSM 5 
we have to leverage this argument in order to be able to do something. So the FDA has already reclassified two kinds of transcription metrics as not generally recognized as safe. One question is, could we reclassify the race of food additive instead of a food After all, it's called average sugar. A food additive. And could we make that not generally recognized as safe? If so, that would then reduce the burden on society. It would reduce the amount that any uh, food industry can start to put in any given food to a limit set by, say, the FDA. And that would have its own weight in terms of the um, uh, effects on the food industry would ultimately reduce consumption. So, that depends on what graphs we do. Okay. Graphs is defined here. Generally recognized among experts qualified by scientific training and experience to evaluate its safety as having been adequately shown for scientific procedures to be safe under the conditions and intended Our current level of consumption was never intended. The last time this was evaluated was 1986, when we just didn't have as much. And it was since then that we've seen this explosion in country diabetes. Now, it's been around for a long time. That person is discovering. Instead of food, okay? we consume half. We consume half as much as the last 1986 um, uh, evaluation before the hypertension clinical trial. And at that time, it was considered inconclusive. So, to understand the argument completely, I suggest you reduce to relatively lay articles that you don't have time. Essentially, no science in them. This article from five years ago called "Is Food Toxic?" written by Gary Thompson and our researcher at UCSF. And also, a comment that I wrote with Laura Schmidt and Craig Lindus of the Institute for Health Policy Studies that was in nature for the toxic truth about sugar. So, you all know this is true. I'm posing to you, is this true as well? So, in summary, what I said, it's not about obesity, it's about chronic metabolic disease. Food addiction is a misnomer because the items in food that are addictive are added and not in the food. I have a salt and the same as the food, but not, are not themselves addictive. The only item in junk food, the items in junk food that are addictive are the sugar and the caffeine, but they're food additives. So you can say food additive addiction for sure. Just because something is calories doesn't make it a food. The only fix is by changing how we look at this on the graph list, like we did with transaction later. The graph focuses on toxicity, not addiction, and fructose is both. Toxic and addictive, which means that it is rife for regulation. And that is going to be my job for the next four years. Even though this administration has zero interest, what we have to do is we have to ban all the medical professions, all the dietary professions, and all of the dental professions together to speak with one voice. And that is my charge for the next four years. That's my plan to deal with this current disaster. Just look at what happened. Processed foods and sweets, 11.6% up to 22.9%. That's what changed. And that's why we have this problem today. And of the 600,000 items in the American food supply, 80% are spiked with added sugar for the food industry purposes, not for yours. I told you reading lots of articles, more articles, more articles, more articles, okay? lots of peer reviewed stuff. Okay. The papers that we just came out showing indeed that sugar is toxic because we replaced sugar with starch and the patients got better, both in terms of their metabolic parameters and also uh, their methods. And here is the successful way to a non profit to take on the truth. So, the Institute for Responsible Nutrition, there's our website right there. And I hope you'll all log in and sign up. I understand your psychiatry. In fact, this is a problem for you, too. Okay. Many of your patients are addicted. In fact, virtually everybody on the planet is addicted to something. They may not know what it is they're addicted to, but they're addicted to something. Because reward is the single most important driver of human behavior. And so, the more reward you seek, the less happy you get. And I will just put in a plug for a new book that will come out on September 12th. That currently is titleless because my publisher took it away. <laughs> but it was going to be called The Agony of Ecstasy. Um, now I'm not sure. It might be called 
know, we, we, this is what we do. We stand strong up and, uh, you know, we're going to keep I think the stress piece of this is enormous. I mean, virtually every behavioral health disorder increases stress in some fashion. And one of the reasons that stress is such a big deal is because it basically puts your kids feet to sleep and ultimately kills it. You know, I mean, one of the, 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 um, the, the chapter in my book on stress and reward is called Killing Jiminy Cricket. You know, and that, you know, that, the, the PFC is the thing that tells you not to do stupid stuff. And the problem is the more stress you're under, the less way the PFC works. And there's plenty of data on FMRI showing that. And the more your dopamine works, you basically, you know, sort of take over. So it becomes a vicious cycle of continued, um, you know, impulsivity and uh, lack of uh, uh, cognitive control. And so there may be some underlying behavioral health disorder that has to be dealt with too. But the add-on, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the pile-on of stress on it, you know, really exacerbates it uh, enormously. But how to deal with that is still, you know, very much open to uh, discussion and debate. clinical trials, and it's based medicine. It's the buzzword. How much of what we know today in percent in medicine is evidence-based? 10%. 90% is not. Now, does that mean that 90% is wrong? Does it even mean that 10% is right? So, here's the problem. There's something called causal medical inference. Causal medical inference. Do you believe in global warming? Got a control group? Do you believe that football trauma causes chronic traumatic encephalopathy? Got a control group? Do you believe that tobacco causes lung cancer? Got a control group? Do you believe that asbestos causes mesothelioma? That one you got because you can actually see the asbestos threads in the tumor. And that's the only one we got after hard and fast evidence for. The rest of them are what we call causal medical inference. Because you can't do a randomized controlled trial of taking naive people and start smoking some and not smoking others and seeing what the incidence and prevalence of lung cancer will be 20 or 30 years down the line. It's illegal, immoral, unethical, and you would end up in jail. Now, to show that sugar is addictive, or to show that sugar causes metabolic syndrome, you have to basically take people who are naive to sugar, which are none, and modify and monitor their diets for the next 50 years. Somebody on a high sugar low sugar, and they have to be on the exact same number of calories and everything else, but have to be controlled to the same level. You have to be supplying their food for 50 years in order to see who got more heart disease or diabetes. Ain't gonna happen. Not possible. Immoral, illegal, and ethical, and you end up in jail. Can't be done. So, we have this backstop called causal medical inference, where you use natural history studies that have a time component. It has to have a time component. And you also have to be able to factor out all the confounders statistically. 
If you do that kind of analysis, you can use natural history studies to still prove causation. That's what the Boston Branch of Work criteria are. And that's the level of proof that we have for tobacco and lung cancer even today. Yet none of you would doubt it. So, do I think you have to do randomized controlled trials? No. You just have to be very, very vigorous in your statistical analysis of the data that does exist. You have to understand what the foibles and the flaws in those analyses are to be able to determine whether or not it actually demonstrates cause. Cause requires proximate cause. In other words, precedence. You have to show that something precedes something else in order to show cause. So, for two and diabetes, we found three years. When I was going to tell that the changes in the country, diabetes changes in the same direction three years later. That's cause. Okay? Cross section studies. Not cost. That's not, not moving. You need the time factor. Much more the time factor if you're going to establish cost. Does that help? Concerns about nitrates, there's, there's concerns about you know various food colorings and stuff that there's certainly concerns about certain diet treatments like aspartame. Um, you know, there's been concerns about food sugar alcohols too. Yeah, I, I have not done those studies. I am familiar with them. I don't think we have enough data to cause except the nitrates that we have cause for uh, to be able to talk about them in public. Yeah, because they say that the only one that's been shown to be a really uh, phenomenal that's been shown to be a different is binging in this world. I mean, binging just sort of marks the really nice for lack of prediction. So they say that that's not about any food, a given food, that's about eating. So they're saying that they'll, they'll give the binging disorder is the same as food addiction, but they won't call it eating addiction, so it takes food away from any specific food. Um, no. <laughs> well, because when you talk about food, you're talking about survival. I mean, that's, that's the basic uh, premise is you have to eat. You don't have to consume alcohol. You don't have to smoke. Okay, you can stop those cold turkey and you'll be better off. You can't stop eating. Well, that's the question. The question is how do you, they, they exclude alcohol and caffeine. I think sugar fits under alcohol and caffeine also as a food additive. And uh, so I'm saying that I actually agree with them that it's not food addiction, it's food additive addiction, but since sugar has been put in all the food, it's despised as food addiction. And if we put the sugar out, we would get unaddicted. That's my point. But we can't get the sugar out because sugar is a food. That's, that's the idea. Tell you where we were before November 8th. <laughs> now I don't know. I mean, Donald Trump has already told us that he's going to do every, every, every regulation there is. Uh, so I don't see any you know, more regulations coming down the pipe anytime soon for this. Uh, what I can say is that prior, we were actually making the news. And we know that we were making the news because the USDA came up with a 10% upper limit. The FDA decides to put added sugar on the food label, and there are taxes for sugar in the UK, Mexico, 
and put it in South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, maybe Saudi Arabia, Philadelphia, San Francisco, Berkeley, Oakland, Boulder, and Chicago. Okay? All of that in the last two years. So I would say we were we had a pretty good audio record. When you think about it, things started to turn. And the question is, will that now stop in its tracks? I just don't know. Thank you. 
like which is just with us. That I kept a look, which is locked us. But the book got locked us because he went to do custom deliver and he managed that. So basically, it's good post and trust us. That's how there is. Carbohydrate is good post. Polymer. Polymer is good post in different ways. Red rice, pasta, potatoes. So we're all good post. Sugar is good post. I think fructose. But it's free or bound. So it's free to this price, so it's bound to sucrose. Agave, maple syrup, honey, or all sucrose, doesn't matter. 